Welcome to the Grow Your Business and Grow Your Wealth podcast with Gary Helt. Gary is an expert in helping business owners put together a plan that will provide a better future for their businesses, themselves, and their families. On the podcast, Gary interviews other professionals who share his vision, and together they share secrets and strategies any business owner can use to build a better financial foundation for your business and your life. Welcome back to the podcast. This week, my guest is Crystal Patton, who is the founder and CEO of Empowered Legacy Planning. Welcome, Crystal. Thank you for having me, Gary. So, Crystal, tell us, what what made you get into law? Oh, my gosh. Uh, <laughs> you, yeah, you're in for a treat on this one. Um, actually, from the time I was a little girl, I always wanted to be a lawyer. Don't know why. I didn't have any professionals in my family, but uh, I wanted to sue my grandmother for being mean to my dad. <laughs> and <laughs> I realized, obviously, as I kind of grew up, they could really just do it for being mean. But there were a number of things that I watched within my own family uh, from the estate planning side that really was eye-opening to me as a young child and impacted me as I grew and decided what type of a, a, you know, a career path that I wanted to have. So estate planning and business law, it was. <laughs> That's great. It's amazing because lots of times, you know, I, I got into to taxes because of an issue that happened with, with my mom. And, you know, it, it's, it's amazing with our different professions and, and why we get into what we get into. Yes. It, I think it brings, it helps bring another layer of passion when, You've dealt with things and seen things in your own life as well, because, you know, we can, we can just bring another, another level of understanding and empathy to clients in their own situations too. Right. Right. I agree. So uh, tell us in, in, with the state planning, what are some of the common mistakes that you're, that you're seeing your clients make or, or people make before they become your client? Gotcha. Um, One of the biggest mistakes that I see is that people believe that once they do their estate plan, that's the only thing they need to do, right? They get some documents in place, they've signed them, and then they sometimes they go into a pretty envelope or a binder, they put them on a shelf, and they don't think about them again. And I like to tell people they do not sprout arms and legs when something happens, whether you become incapacitated or you pass away your documents will not alone solve all the problems. And so I think that's probably the biggest mistake is that people have a mindset of I've done it and I don't need to think about it again. Right. So, yeah, I think that's the biggest one for sure. Sounds like business owners with their business plan, they get it and they (laughs) put it in the drawer and never to look at it again. Yes, absolutely. Uh, Another mistake that I often see for people, especially when they're doing trust-based planning, is that they don't title their assets to the trust. They They fail to fund their trust. And a lot of times people think, well, what do you mean by funding your trust? But it's really making sure that assets are titled properly and the beneficiaries are updated in an appropriate way so that the assets pass the way that you intend based on your estate plan. So sometimes people never fund their trust or they only do a few of their assets, like maybe their bank account and their primary residence. Um, But I often see as well where people have created a plan, they have their house in the trust Mm -hmm. and now they've refinanced. And when they refinance their property, many lenders require that that property come out of the trust and sometimes it never goes back in. And so that's, that's another mistake. Again, kind of the set and forget it. They've done it once or they think that they've got it complete and they just don't worry about it. And that can really throw a plan off uh, and cause a lot of unnecessary expense and heartache when someone, again, becomes incapacitated or passes away. Right. Yeah. You know, in these type of situations, obviously, it sounds like, hey, I need to I need to update this, you know, uh, I'm, I don't know if we want to say often, but I need to update this as, as things happen. Yeah. How often do you recommend, uh, you know, someone to get together with their estate attorney? So for me, I, I do recommend that clients 
have a time of year that they pull out their documents and look at their plan, I would say once a year. So whether it's January 1st, that they think about all aspects of their financial life, whether it's tax day, right. whether it's the, the anniversary of the day that they did their trust originally or something like that. But to look at it and think about, are all of the people that I've named in my plan still living? Has anyone gotten married? Has anyone been divorced? Are there new people that I might want to incorporate in the plan? Are my assets differently? And if any one of those things are a yes, they definitely need to meet with their estate attorney. I would say most people aren't going to do that. Let's be realistic. They should. So I would say probably every three years is a good time frame. Now, in our practice, we're a little bit different because we have a standardized or a formalized maintenance program for our trust-based clients where we send out a packet to them every year and we ask them those questions. Have these things occurred? And if yes, we need to see you and we want them to come in, we update documents for them. And then every three years, we get updated documents for all of the docs, healthcare powers of attorney, financial powers of attorney. Um, everything so that we are keeping things fresh and addressing any issues that may have slipped through the cracks that they forgot to tell us about in the other years. Right. You know, the life changes happen. Um, like, you know, someone passes away or, or you have a new child or, or whatever it may be. Um, and, and those are always, you know, important times to, to get together. Um, can you talk about, because many times people get confused when it comes to, you know, what my trust and estate may say as compared to what my uh, IRAs or my, uh, you know, life insurance may say? Yeah, absolutely. So whenever there's an asset that has a beneficiary designated on that asset, that is a contractual arrangement with that company. And they are obligated by law to distribute the asset to the person that is named on the beneficiary designation form. In many cases, they also have a, have a default of designation type of provision in the life insurance policy or the plan with the IRA custodian or the 401k administrator that says, what happens if you don't have a beneficiary designated? And so the issue that I often run into is that in many cases, the beneficiaries on those types of assets don't match or are not in line with the estate plan. And it's not that they have to be perfectly in line, but it should be done consciously if a client is not going to have it match their estate plan. So when someone does have a trust, or even a will-based plan, making sure that they do have beneficiaries named on all the assets they can is super important. Like you mentioned, life insurance policies, 401ks, IRAs, annuities. And in some states, like Arizona, you can even use a beneficiary on a property. So you can have a beneficiary mm -hmm. deed. You can do a beneficiary on your business entity. You can do one on vehicles. So even without a trust in some states, there are ways to avoid that horrible probate process right. that we've all heard about. But again, I think the key is making sure to do it all consciously and purposefully. So thinking about what you actually want and bringing everything in, in alignment. Yeah, I think you know many times I, I've seen where you know people come to us after the fact and trying to help them with the, with the tax side of things it's like okay well you know my dad you know i was a beneficiary of my dad's life insurance but according to his will i'm supposed to give a third to you know my brothers and sisters and you know we have to then explain to them well you you get the money tax free but then when you pass it to your brother and sister now suddenly that's a gift yeah. Um, even though that that the will says something something differently, um, so so I think you know, like you're saying, I think it's really important to 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 make sure that that you're talking and updating. I mean, we've even seen the nightmares where you know someone was previously married, never updated the beneficiary on the life insurance policy, mm -hmm. and so that the first spouse is the one who gets the the benefit of the life insurance as compared to the children of the of 
the deceased or the the new uh, spouse. Yes, yes, absolutely. You hit the nail on the head. Um, I always tell people when they when they do those beneficiary designations, like I mentioned, they're a contractual arrangement, and the financial company has to pay out to the individual who received it. And now that person is under a moral obligation to follow the terms of the trust, but there is nothing that legally requires them to do so. It's the same thing if they've named a child as a joint owner on a property or a bank account or something of that nature. And again, you, you mentioned it, it does become a gift if they have to, if they decide that they are going to follow that moral right. obligation and, and split those assets. And yeah, you know, I mean, we've got our annual gift exclusion, which is this year, you know, $16,000. And then we have our lifetime exemption. And many clients right now, or many individuals are not going to hit that lifetime amount, but they still have to file a 706 gift tax return yep. or 709, excuse me, if it's over the $16,000 and they don't realize that. And, um, you know, some people are just lucky they don't get caught, I guess, but uh, right. you right. and I both know, and and exactly. you know, you got to do it. <laughs> right. Well, and, and I think lots of times what people don't understand too, is that it's, it's based on what you give for the whole year. So if I, you know, if, if I write you a check for 16 grand and, you know, that's my gift to you, but then later on, I send you a check for your birthday. Right. You know, and that's what I try to explain to parents and, and grandparents. It's like, okay, don't give the max because you're going to give stuff throughout the year. And in case anything ever happens and you're audited for any reason, they may look at this. Right. Absolutely. So what are some of the biggest fears that that you are seeing um, people have before they come in and, and sit down with you? Oh, gosh. I think in many cases, people have been conditioned to fear probate and what that means. And so I think for many of our clients, that is the biggest fear or one of the biggest fears that they have. And like I mentioned, in some states, it's really it's pretty easy to avoid probate and we can do so with a number of estate planning tools. In some states, it is really horrible to go through probate and it is a very valid fear and people should make, you know, kind of let that guide them. But the other fears that I often run into, um, remarriage. Mm -hmm. If one spouse passes away and the survivor gets remarried, are they going to leave everything to the new spouse and inadvertently or purposefully cut out the children, right? right. Especially in a blended family situation. Uh, we also see clients who are concerned about future divorces for their own children. They don't want what they give to their loved ones to be taken by what I like to call as the outlaws um, in the future, should there be a divorce and things like that. So those are some of the biggest fears that that I see. And then the other side that we, we see a little bit of is the clients who have special needs beneficiaries. Sometimes they don't understand that we have to leave assets to those individuals in a different way in order to protect the benefits that they are entitled to. And so for, for clients that have a, you know, a child who has been disabled and they're dealing with that, they often are more aware of the things that need to be done. But sometimes grandparents want to leave assets to a special needs grandchild to help with them. And they may not be aware of the importance of how to leave assets appropriately for that individual. So knowing that they have these incapacitated people, that is the fear. And then we can help them again with the various tools we have provide some protections there. Right. I think that that's, that's an extremely important part because like you're saying, if you have someone with, with special needs or incapacitated in some way, you know, they're, they're receiving benefits possibly from the county, the state, the federal government. And if they suddenly get all of these assets, then they're going to be deemed not needy anymore. Right. <laughs> um, I, I think another thing to to look at with that also is if you have minor children um, and, and, you know, how do you want to give to them? Because I can tell you, you know, I love my kids, but, you know, when they turn 18, I don't want them having, you know, a bunch of money because who knows what they're going to do with it. Uh, amen. 
<laughs> you know, it, it, they're, anecdotally, I've seen it as well. And I know a lot of colleagues have, uh, but it doesn't seem to matter the age of the individual beneficiary or the amount that they're receiving on average, whatever it is that they get is typically gone in about 18 months or so. That's yeah, so scary. Yeah. But I think a lot of it is it's, it's like winning the lottery. It's free money to them. And so they always think that there's going to be more, right. but there's not. And for a young individual, you know, it, it's so what young individuals face today is a lot different than even what you and I faced when we were 18 years old right. or 21 right. years old. And a lot of our clients have children that are you know, 21, 25, 30, who have, who are still struggling to fly the nest, get established in their own lives. So their careers are starting later. Things are just a little bit more risky in terms of debt and other things like that for them. And so I encourage our clients to think about alternative ways to leave assets to those beneficiaries, whether they're young children, and we don't yet know how they're going to turn out, or they are reaching that young adult stage, uh, there are ways that we can leave assets to any of our beneficiaries that are protected from potential creditors that they may have in the future, as well as potential divorces and themselves, right? We don't know what hits of life they may run right. into in the future. Right, right, yeah. I think that that's, again, talking with the professionals and, and, and staying up with that is, is extremely important. Uh, that's for sure. And just the, the education that comes along with it, you know, certainly helps, helps also. So you've been doing this for a while now. What do you wish you, you knew then that you know now? Oh, goodness. <laughs> um, from a client perspective, you know, there's something new that we learn every day. Right. But I would say that the issues seem to be getting more complex. When I started in my practice, the estate tax exemption was much lower. And, you know, I was trained in dealing with a lot of that stuff, but we, it really hasn't been an estate planning issue for the vast majority of people for many years now. Our estate tax exemption in 2022 is $12.06 million per person. So a married couple can pass almost $24 million with very a straightforward estate planning. And again, many, many people, most people do not have an estate tax issue from a real perspective, but the focus has absolutely shifted to personal planning issues. And we all see changes in the world and family lives and other things like that. And I just, that's what I have seen. The issues are becoming more complicated, but the other piece of that is with the availability of Google and legal right. zoom and other things, people think that these are very easy things for them to deal with. And they will often try to tackle them on their own right. as a trustee, a successor trustee. I have seen many people mess up, even though they thought they were doing the right thing because they didn't really truly understand what the process was for administration. And so that's what I have seen, you know, what I would say, what, is different than what I know then to now. Education has always been a part of my practice, but I think I would have tried to focus a little bit more on the next generation rather than just our clients so that that next generation could understand the importance of working with a professional at all steps throughout the estate plan and the administration. Yeah, I think many times, you know, like you're saying with the with the online services that are that are out there, people try to try to do it themselves. And if you haven't been through the process before, then there's many things that you're going to miss and you're 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 not going to see you just don't know about. Um, and that ends up costing you a lot more money, you know, in the long run. Um, so it's always much better to seek out that professional to, to help you, you know, get your plan together. That's for sure. Yeah. I, I'll to share a little story here, Gary. One of the saddest situations that I've ever had to work with a beneficiary on, uh, this, this woman came to meet with us after her friend had passed away. 
she brought with her to that meeting a trust that the friend had prepared herself online. I don't know what service she used, but she had prepared her own trust. It was actually executed. And so that's fantastic. But it used what we call schedule funding. And what I mean by that is that she added a list of her assets to the end of the document. She wrote on there the pieces of property, real property that she owns. She listed her bank accounts. And that was it. She never went through the process of transferring assets into her trust from a title perspective. And she, the other part was that was the only document she did. She didn't have any other documents in place. When you have a trust, it is very important to have a will that accompanies that trust. And the will is what we call a pour over will. And what it does is essentially sweeps into the trust any assets that may have been left out so that the trust controls where those assets go. Now, that will does have to go through probate, but I like to call it a sweater in a suitcase. We have it just in case. We right. want to be prepared if we have a situation where we need it. Well, in this case, we did not have a pour over will. And we have assets that did not actually legally belong belonged to the trust at that point. The woman that came in was designated as the successor trustee. She was designated as the beneficiary under that plan. And we talked to her about how there was no, there, there was no easy way to get those assets over to her. We would have to start litigation and try to convince the court here in Arizona that the person that made this trust had the intent for these assets to go into the trust. That may not work here, right. but with a long shot, we could have done it. The sad part was this, the trust maker had four siblings who she was estranged from, hadn't spoken to in years, who were now her legal heirs. She died what we call intestate. So those people were entitled to those assets. They were entitled to notice. And that beneficiary didn't end up doing anything. It was so heartbreaking because we had a solution, but it was going to cost a lot of money to go through that process. And there was no guarantee that we were going to be successful. And so that was probably the, the saddest, most recent one that we dealt with because a simple document would have been able to solve that. A pour over will we would have been able to open probate. She would have been able to do it. We would have swept in all of those assets and they would have made it to the beneficiary that that person wanted. In this case, it didn't happen. And that's not uncommon. And I think it's only going to be more common the more we see people DIYing their estate. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, I agree. I mean, and that's that's a perfect scenario that that probably happens more often than not. Um, and just, you know, get with the proper professionals to, to do this because, you know, how many of us have, have you know, relatives or, or people in our, in our lives that, that we are estranged from, that we really don't want anything to go to, right. but if we don't do the proper thing, it's going to, that's for sure. Yeah. Um, what challenges, I mean, you, you, you talk some about, you know, the challenges earlier about, you know, working with the next generation and things like that, but what other challenges do you see coming from if it's with the current administration now, um, or just, uh, because of us coming out of the pandemic, you know, business wise, what, what challenges do you see coming? I, what I am seeing right now is that people are hesitating to move forward with estate planning because it is seen as a non-necessity. Um, I, as an estate planner, don't feel that way. I right. feel that everyone needs an estate plan, but it is an investment and people are in some ways short-sighted about that. And so that is one thing that we're starting to see is that some people are pulling back on estate planning because they are concerned about spending the money to get things done appropriately right now. Right. But that's, that's a business concern for me and a challenge to educate people about why it's so important to continue moving forward. But 
across the board, I think the biggest challenge that all of us are going to start seeing has to do with the SECURE Act. And I don't know if you have spoken, spoken with your uh, listeners about the SECURE Act before, but it is, it's a really rough one for, for clients. And so what we're talking to our clients about in relation to that law, you know, it came into place on January 1st of 2020. And we thought we knew what was going on with that. And then we just had our proposed regulations that came out in February. They had the hearing on June 15th. And we're still waiting to hear if all those regulations are going to become permanent at this point. But essentially, it really upended the way that beneficiaries will be able to receive inherited retirement assets moving forward. A lot of people will try to make it, make it seem like there's a lot of great things about the Secure Act, and maybe there were some things, but this, this was something that was slid in, in a way to generate quite a bit of tax revenue. And we are going through one of the, well, probably the greatest transfer of wealth in our history with the baby boomers passing away and their assets passing on uh, to their beneficiaries. And you know, when even when I started 15 years ago, the amount of money that clients had in their retirement accounts was much lower. We might have been talking to 300, that's maybe $500,000 in retirement accounts. And now many of our clients are, well, maybe not with the recent downturn, but we were, you know, around 800,000, a million dollars, $1.5 million in retirement assets. And the SECURE Act now shortens the length of time that beneficiaries have to withdraw that money. So with, there are a few exceptions, but for most beneficiaries, they are going to have a maximum of 10 years to withdraw the entire balance of the inherited retirement accounts that they receive. That is a challenge for them because they are many times going to be in their highest earning years. So it's going to potentially jump the, you know, pop them up into a higher tax bracket. Um, it's just, and when that money comes out, it's unprotected. So for many of our clients, like I mentioned, protection from potential divorces or creditors for beneficiaries is important. And now all of that is going to pass eventually outright uh, outside of those protections in the trust. So yeah, that is what I see, Gary, as the biggest challenge. And there are some ways to deal with that. But I'm also seeing clients that say, well, it's not necessarily affecting me personally today. And so they don't want to do some of the advanced planning that will alleviate some of that burden for their beneficiaries later. How, right. Would you say the same? I mean, have you seen that as well? Yes, yes. And I mean, you know, because before, you know, like you said, I mean, it, it gave people a lot longer time to, mm -hmm. to have to withdraw the money. Um, and it gave us time from a from a tax planning standpoint to strategically plan when they're going to start taking their withdrawals to now it's, you know, we really have to look at it, you know, okay, when 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 do you plan on retiring? When are you is your income going to be down? What's going on with that to, to then make that decision on when they actually take those distributions? Um, and then it just, you know, again, it complicates the whole estate side of things anyway. It does. It does. Yeah. Um, I definitely, I definitely think that this was, uh, you know, the current administration way of doing a money grab, you know, that's for sure, because, you know, they need, need some tax dollars, um, you know, for sure. Well, if you remember, Gary, though, that, I mean, it, that the SECURE Act was passed when right. President Trump was still in office and it, right. it kind of slid in in 2020 under that. The, the provision about accelerating distributions from inherited IRAs has been bandied around in, in Congress for right. many, many years. Um, the government needed the tax revenue, right? Oh, yeah. And this was a way to do it. And so I don't know that it is one administration versus another necessarily, but at the end of the day, we all know we are in a position, especially with all the money that we printed oh, during yeah. COVID yeah. and with the CARES Act, this is a way and they're doing it. And it, it's not going to go back to the old rules where we were able to stretch uh, those distributions on life expectancy forever. Right. Uh, we're just going to have to work on some ways to, to manage it, like you said, strategically for those beneficiaries as they move forward. So I think that's, that is definitely something that we all need to explain and educate our clients on 
is that when they pass away, their beneficiaries need to seek professional guidance. They need to work with their financial advisor and their CPA. And yes, to a certain, a certain extent, the attorney as well, but especially those individuals are going to look at the tax perspective of that individual person and talk about how those distributions are going to affect them over the next 10 years. Yeah. Right, right. And, it, and again, going back to, to, to the planning side of things, I mean, you know, I'm starting to see more and more, um, and I'm going to call them the grandparents that are looking at, okay, I want to see, I want to see my kids and grandkids enjoy, you know, the money that, that we're going to leave them. So a lot of them are looking at, you know, giving money now as compared to waiting upon death to, to do that. Yeah. Um, so I think that that's something that I, that I think that, that we're going to see more of also. Yes. Yes. I, I think that that will also continue to occur for sure. Right. All right. We've, we've covered a bunch of stuff in a, in a quick period of time here. What if I not asked you that you wish I had? Oh my goodness. Well, I, I think the one thing that we didn't touch on that I, we probably should is just the importance of healthcare directives as well. And, and financial powers of attorney. So financial powers of attorney need to be updated on a regular basis uh, because what we are seeing financial institutions do is say that those documents are stale or no longer good or valid after a certain number of years, even if from a legal perspective, that is not true. So some banks that we see you know, have maybe that that document can't be more than a year old or two years old. Um, again, not from a legal perspective, but their own internal side of things. So it is important, like we talked about earlier, to not set and forget an estate plan, but to regularly update these documents to keep them fresh. Um, if people do not have updated docs that deal with digital assets, they should also be thinking about updating for that reason. Um, digital assets are not just Bitcoin or NFTs or people things that people are hearing about on the news, but it's, it is your email, your photos, your, uh, you know, online banking, your password management system, whatever the case is, but that's, that's definitely something that people should take some time to organize and to think about. And then, to, like I said, update the financial power of attorney every so often. The healthcare directives, again, I think are extremely important to have. Every state has a you know, a list of people who get to make medical decisions for you if you can't make them for yourself, but those people do not necessarily automatically have the ability to access your protected health information. So how are they going to make decisions for you if they can't talk to the doctors or get information? HIPAA prohibits a lot of that. So making sure that they have current and appropriate healthcare directives for the state they live in is also very important. Yeah. So you, you brought up the, the financial power of attorney. Um, how does how does that differ from, you know, because, you know, some people I've heard say, oh, well, you know, the, the financial, all you need is a financial power of attorney. And then you can take care of all the affairs. But doesn't that expire at a, at a certain time and not just the bank saying, hey, it's stale data? <laughs> right. Yes, absolutely. So a financial power of attorney becomes void at that. It ends right then. So it is only good during your lifetime. And most financial powers of attorney now are what we call durable powers of attorney, meaning that they're good when you sign them and they're good if you become incapacitated, right? That's really the whole purpose. We want right. people to be able to manage our affairs if we can't but those do not survive death. And so when we think about an estate plan as a whole, I try to explain to clients that anything that is owned by the trust, your property, your bank account, that's managed by the person that's wearing the trustee hat, right? They're going to put on the hat of the trustee. And now let's say they are signing a tax return or they are updating the address of the mailbox or they're dealing with some other type of, you know, social security benefit or the retirement accounts that are not even in the trust, right? right? They need to put on their agent hat under the financial power of attorney. Might be the same person, but their authority comes from different documents. But uh, yeah, you're absolutely right. That financial power of attorney is void at death. And then we move back into the will and the power or the, the trust and who has the authority to manage assets after death. 
Right, right. And you've given us a lot of great, great information. <laughs> if our listeners like what they hear and they want to reach out to you and talk to you uh, about their situation or maybe a loved one, how, how can they reach you? Yeah, absolutely. So our office is based in Arizona. We are located in Tempe, Arizona. The best way to reach out to us is at hello at LegacyLawAZ.com. Uh, and then, of course, we have more information on our website and blogs and you know links to social media where we share videos and other things as well. And that website is LegacyLawAZ.com. Great. Crystal, I really appreciate your time today. Uh, you've really given us a lot of uh, good information to think about. Thank you so much, Gary. I appreciate being here and uh, I've enjoyed our time. Thank you. Thank you. This week, our guest was Crystal Patton, who's the founder and CEO of Empowered Legacy Planning. See you guys next week. This show has been produced by Market Domination, LLC. To discover how you can have your own show completely done for you and turn it into a real published book and become the authority in your marketplace, go to www.marketdominationllc.com slash podcast offer.